welcome back to another episode. We've got somebody really awesome today. Um, he is somebody that works in the ALF press room. It's a branch of the Animal Liberation Front that opened up in order to communicate with the uh, media about the doings and transpirings of the ALF. Uh, we got Mr. Jerry Vlasic. How are you, Jerry? I'm doing well. Thanks for having me. So maybe we can start out by just a rough overview of for people that may be living under a rock, what is the ALF and, and kind of what's the short history there? So the Animal Liberation Front is one of uh, uh, several um, direct action organizations that uh, believe in uh, working for a cause, in this case, animal uh, liberation, uh, and are willing to uh, help animals by doing things that are currently illegal under a, a legal system that actually advocates for the killing of billions of animals every year uh, in order for people to make a profit and for people to eat meat and drink dairy and, and go to circuses and zoos and all the other things uh, where animals are exploited. So there are some people who feel like that um, holding a protest sign or writing a letter to their legislator isn't really enough. And so they actually take additional steps and do things to directly liberate animals from conditions of abuse or inflict economic sabotage on people who profit off of animal abuse. And so basically anyone that uh, breaks the law to either help an animal or to inflict uh, harm or sabotage on someone who is hurting animals can consider themselves a member of the Animal Liberation Front. It's a, it's a very non-hierarchical uh, uh, and non-centralized structure because as you can imagine, if there was a headquarters somewhere with a phone number and a building and, and a membership card and everything, then law enforcement would relatively easily infiltrate that and find the people that were breaking the law and, and lock them up. Instead, it's a, it's a very, they're very autonomous cells of people that operate uh, in a clandestine fashion and virtually no one ever gets caught. I mean, they're, um, over the last 30 years or so that I've been in the business, I, you know, a scant handful of people have ever gone to jail for, for doing this, despite the fact that there've been literally thousands and thousands of actions, illegal actions that help animals. So that in a nutshell is the ALF. There are some other organizations that have slightly different guidelines. The ALF, for instance, um, has a set of guidelines that, that uh, very explicitly uh, states they do they do everything they can not to harm any human being or non-human being. There are other organizations that say, hey, you know, making threats against humans that are torturing animals and won't stop when you give them every other option in the world, then that's okay. But they don't consider themselves the ALF and that there are other various organizations. Well, what you're saying is that this kind of common sense or this kind of feeling about animals is something that exists independently within everybody at some point in every town that you could go to, there's somebody who sees what's going on with animals and says, you know, I don't know if I believe. So it's a, a decentralized group and you can join at any time. You don't need to sign up or pay dues or anything. You just become the ALF, as I understand it. Yeah. Any single person or, you know, close group of, uh, uh, people who know each other and, and work together um, can basically form these autonomous cells and become members of the Animal Liberation Front and do things to help animals. Uh, it's not the only way to help animals. I mean, there's lots of ways that people ha have found over the, the years to help animals, including legislative efforts that have made some differences, including, um, uh, you know, running sanctuaries for animals that uh, need homes to, to live and, and things like that. But like in any other struggle, any other successful social structure, uh, social struggle throughout time and, and even concurrently, there's always a group of people who have to take it to the next level and who have to go behind the scenes and who have to break the laws in order to uh, further that struggle. So, I mean, you can talk about, you know, uh, Mahatma Gandhi being peaceful and, and affecting change in India. But behind him, there were lots of people that were breaking the law and using weapons. Nelson Mandela uh, is considered a peaceful person, but he he uh, took up the gun uh, earlier on in his career and was part of a an underground movement that was fighting apartheid. So mm -hmm. every movement has always had people that were willing to work outside the law in order to affect uh, change that would uh, lead to the um, 
liberation of some oppressed group. And the animal liberation group is no different. As a press officer with the press office, I'm not a member of the ALF or a member of any of these groups, but I serve as a uh, as a go between. We serve as a go between. There's more than just me, but we serve as a go between, uh, so that we uh, uh, speak for these people who can't speak for themselves. Because obviously, if they they say, "Hey, I broke into this lab and and did this or that," then obviously they they'd be arrested. But I can say, "Hey, I don't know who that guy is. I don't know what his name is. I don't know where he lives." But I know what he did and I know why he did it. And here's why he did it. And if you want to if you want to write a story about this and you want to hear both sides of the story, then then we're here to provide that. Yeah, absolutely. And, and uh, it's important that you have an intermediary because of the reputation and, you know, the track record of the ALF, as I understand it, is they haven't hurt any humans. Is that true? Yeah, that is correct. There's there's never been a documented case of the Animal Liberation Front harming a human being. They take every precaution they can not to. Mm -hmm. um, and, and so far have been, uh, I mean, they, a lot of actions that have been aborted or not done because there was some risk to human beings. That's not to say it won't ever happen. Uh, I, I, there's no way to guarantee that if you're going to, you know, say burn down a, a, uh, they, they, they burned a, a horse corral, for instance, uh, in uh, the Northwest uh, a number of years ago that was being used when they were rounding up wild horses and then sending them off to slaughter. Yeah. I mean, you can never be sure that some human could not be harmed. And, and, and when you do an action like that, it may, some idiot may run into the fire and get burned or, you know, something like that. But again, they take every, uh, they take every precaution that they possibly can. And so far, uh, no human has been harmed. So that being said, knowing that they haven't hurt anybody, they've still ranked pretty high on a terrorist list from places like the FBI. Um, and also in the media, it seems like the message is, and that's kind of why you started, was the message was getting obfuscated through um, the narrative that they wanted to provide. Have you noticed yourself sometimes when the media or the government tried to spin spin it in a way to sound, make you guys sound more dangerous or the, the ALF more dangerous than they are? Oh, absolutely. Yeah, the uh, ALF was deemed as one of the, the top terrorist organizations in the United States in 2005. In fact, I testified before a, a Senate subcommittee about the about the topic, and uh, you know we the media is willing to call anybody a terrorist these days. I mean, if you're a school teacher and you uh, you know you go on strike or something, you can be called a terrorist. And, <laughs> and remember, we've been doing this since uh, I've been I've been doing this since before 9/11, and so things obviously changed after 9/11, and it got even more heated, and, and there was even more rhetoric. But when you think about it, I mean, who are the terrorists? People that are going out trying to help animals that are being abused or the people that murder animals and, and torture animals every day, you know, day in and day out. And we, we kill over 9 billion sentient feeling uh, animals every year just because people want to eat them and that people want to make a profit off of uh, selling their corpses so that people, other people can eat them. 9 billion animals a year are, are murdered in this. And now, now who are the terrorists? I mean, who, Who's terrorizing who here? Mm -hmm. And that's the way we try to turn the turn the story around. Yeah. And I did want to mention the story of the Weathermen Underground because they had a similar philosophy when they they I think they hurt a few people, killed a few people, but they were so radical. But they the six thousand people a week that the Vietnamese were dying in that war. Um and I and I and I always think, you know, at some point you will find yourself fighting fire with fire because you know, good can't really corrupt evil, but evil can certainly corrupt good. And so that will make it so we're inevitably going to have to use all necessary means to put an end to what we consider injustice. Well, absolutely. And I, and I got into trouble a few years back when I when I made basically that same statement. And I said that uh, there, there might be times when, strategically speaking, it was, you know, for the harm harming a, a very few number of human individuals could result in the uh, alleviation of suffering of millions, if not, you know, tens of millions of, of non-human animals. And so, if you're strictly utilitarian, like somebody like Peter Singer or somebody like that, if you're if you're utilitarian, and you go, well, yeah. So we, we could kill this guy and this guy and this guy and a million animals are now not going to be tortured to death in some stupid laboratory. OK, yeah. that hasn't happened. But on the other hand, you know, I mean, 
like I said, every social justice movement has, has had to use uh, some sort of force at some point uh, to get what they want. The oppressor doesn't tend to stop oppressing until they're forced to, and some and the use of that force then. And, and really, if you think about it, it's 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 what uh, Steve Best uh, has titled extensional self-defense. In other words, it's the use of force in self-defense. If someone is coming after you and trying to harm you and you use a baseball bat to, to break their knees, that's considered legitimate use of force. And you're not considered a, you're not considered a bad person for that. Well, if somebody was trying to kill your children, but not you directly, but was trying to kill your children, again, you could use force to stop that from happening. Well, what about if somebody's trying to kill your dog? Okay. Or use somebody's trying to, to beat your dog to death and, and you step in and intervene and with the use of force is, is that, uh, is that morally, uh, morally useful and sensible? And, and, uh, and it is, I think. And so, then you can just extend that and say, well, it's not just my dog, but how about everybody else's dog? What if somebody is trying to kill everybody else's dog? Or what if somebody's trying to kill 800 million cows just because they like to cut them up and make them into hamburgers and, and make a lot of money? Uh, is that right? Or should those people be stopped using whatever means are necessary? I mean, you can ask them nice, you know, start off asking them nice, you know, yeah. start off uh, pick, picketing outside their company headquarters yeah. or you know, uh, go from there to showing up at their homes on Sunday morning and saying, Hey, stop doing what you're doing, but it's not going to work when there's that much money involved. I mean, it, it's rarely, rarely are these people going to give up, uh, you know, the big bucks that they're making. They, they don't care about the animals. Yeah. So there's a, a wide range of strategies that I think are effective, but ultimately, you know, whatever works. And yeah. if one thing doesn't work, then you should try another. And that's one reason why I'm such a fan of underground direct action, because we've been, We've been asking people for years to stop hurting animals and they don't, they don't yeah. stop. Yeah, yeah. And so we can, we can physically stop them and we can physically stop them without hurting them, which is, you know, the ideal situation. And that's what the ALF does, but there might be situations where you can't stop them without hurting them. And that would be okay too, as far as I'm concerned. Yeah. Yeah. And I'm also at that point, I don't know. I'm not sure if what kind of trouble we'd get in, but uh, I, I condone any, any form of, 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 action that gets results for that cause and as i we, i discussed before i view humanity as a disease and uh we took a left wrong turn in albuquerque as far as evolution goes and we just became bloodthirsty hairless little pasty apes and uh the ma majesty of wildlife will never compare it's so much better and so much more natural. And uh, animals have a natural way of living and they're completely innocent of anything. And so that brings me to a question like, what do you think is the main driver that keeps people from empathizing with these uh, other living beings? What is it? Well, I think we're brainwashed from an early age. I mean, I, I don't think anybody is born wanting to eat an animal. Uh, I think, you know, most children that are, are born, I mean, there's an old, there's an old, uh, uh, scenario where somebody says, yeah, put a, put a live rabbit and an, uh, and an apple in a, in a little baby's crib and see which one it plays with and one, which one it eats, you know? Um, so I think, but we're brainwashed from a very early age to believe that animals are here for us to eat and that not only do they not mind, but it, that we actually are required to eat them. Because if we don't, we won't have strong bones or we won't get enough protein or, uh, you know, any, anything else. But it, basically, that's all propaganda that's fed to us by the meat and dairy industry, for instance, uh, because they want to sell more of their product to us and make more money. And, and because they have so much money and because they have so many lobbyists, uh, the government's on board with it, too. And that's why the government says, yeah, you got to drink cow's milk. Uh, yeah, you got to eat meat. And by the way, we're going to subsidize those businesses so that everybody can get more of it. So yeah. the dairy industry and the meat industry are both heavily subsidized by uh, taxes, our taxes, your taxes, my taxes, uh, but by the government. So uh, if people say, oh, well, being vegan is too expensive. Well, no. First of all, even in today's world, being vegan can be less expensive than, than, a, than being a meat eater. But if you took away all the subsidies that the government was given the meat producers and the, and the dairy producers, then it'd be a lot cheaper to be vegan. Um, 
but uh, the bottom line is we're brainwashed from an early age to think that it's normal to eat animals, uh, to think that it's necessary to eat animals. And uh, none of that's true. Again, as a doctor, I can just tell you, it's a lot better for you to not eat animals. You're, you're much more likely to live a healthy life uh, not eating animals and not drinking cow's milk. I mean, uh, the Pediatric Association of America has, has told people that feeding cow's milk to children is a bad idea. It's re- that's why they get so many ear infections. And it has nothing to do with their bones being healthy. You don't need cow's milk to, ha- to grow a healthy bone. It's uh, just not that way. If you think about it, animals like elephants and rhinoceroses are vegan. And, you know, they don't seem to have any trouble getting enough protein and getting enough uh, calcium for their bones, eating a, a plant-based diet. So there's absolutely, it's all just pure myth. You know, this whole protein thing, you're not going to get enough protein, you're not going to get enough this, not going to get enough that. Mm-hmm. It's all just made up by the meat and dairy industry to, you know, counter the idea of not not buying their product. Mm-hmm. So, you know, we see advertising, the, the milk and dairy industry, for instance, spends $2 billion, that's with a B, billion dollars a year on advertising their product, milk products on uh, on TV and on online and everywhere else. So we're all just made to think that that's what's normal uh, until we start to think for ourselves. And if we, if you get exposed to the idea like I did by a book or by other ways, there's people now all over the world uh, uh, called Anonymous for the Voiceless that hold up television sets in, in public places that show factory farm conditions and then talk to people about it when they're interested. A lot of those people very successful in, in changing people away from eating meat and into a plant-based diet. A lot of the people that are holding the TVs are people that ate meat themselves until they saw one of the TVs and then they become uh, a part of the movement. So there is some hope that we can spread that message. But on the other hand, uh, you know, with human population doing what it's doing and everything else, I don't think there's much chance of creating a vegan world until there's a, a significant reduction in the uh, human numbers on the planet. Yeah. Yeah. And that's where we get into the dark territory, where we start talking about entropy and and how we were a once great species now circling the drain. Uh, and, and we kind of hope that that happens because, yeah. And I always like to say Genghis Khan, he was a huge environmentalist. He actually helped restore the forests of Eurasia by going and ridding the uh, countryside of all those pesky people. And so... <laughs> In his own right, he I'll give him credit for being a great environmentalist. But uh, yeah, so I mean, what do you recommend for people to do on their own um, at this time? Other, you should stop eating meat. And I, I would I told people take the one hour challenge and, and watch one hour of of animal cruelty videos and see if you can if you can stomach that. And then if you, okay, then you're a sociopath, you go have a hamburger. But if you feel something, you can make a change. And I think most people would. I really do. Um, but Well, uh, unfortunately, I have to disagree with you. I, I, I think becoming vegan, obviously, is, is sort of the, the first step. I mean, it's, it's not going to solve the problem, but it's, it's sort of the first step. I mean, you have to, uh, you have to quit, you know, perpetuating an atrocity before you can start to find out why that atrocity is going on. And so if you're eating meat, you're part of the problem. Okay. Right off the bat. Uh, It's easy to stop eating meat. It's easy to watch those videos and see how animals are treated. But I'll tell you my experience, 80% of people that watch the videos uh, and are fully aware of how the animals are treated, just don't give a shit and just won't stop eating meat no matter what. Now the other twenty percent is who we're trying to is who we're trying to get to, okay. and if we could get twenty and if we could get twenty percent of the human population to stop eating meat, then that would have a huge effect, and it would start to snowball, which is already starting to do. I mean, I just got back from New York City um, three days ago, and there were eighteen all vegan restaurants within walking distance of the place I was staying. I mean, there's been a huge shift uh, in the way people think about eating uh, a meatless diet. And, and that's with only a couple of percentage points of people becoming vegan. Uh, so if 20% of the world became vegan, most of the rest of the world would start to follow along because of the, the practicalities of just how things were working. Uh, the majority of the restaurants would be uh, vegan. Uh, again, the government subsidies might start to trickle down and, and meat and dairy would become as expensive as they should be. 
Um, and so it would have a, a snowball effect. And so it's, you know, all is not, not lost just because I can just tell you eight out of 10 people that can watch Earthlings or, or any of the other uh, shows uh, that, that detail and, and graphic detail how animals are treated before they become a piece of meat on your plate. Uh, most of those people will just look at that and go, Oh, that's horrible. I don't want to see it, but they'll still order a, they'll still go out and order a steak or a hamburger or something like that. They just, they just have this cognitive dissonance where they, they won't, they don't want to look at it. They know about it, but they just don't care. But it's the normalization uh, but they, but they, of it. If, if you normalize yeah. it and you get the majority to do it, not only will you, you know, these ba- these people are all sheep anyway. They just go with the flow and they go, okay, this is what everybody else does. That's what I want. They don't think for themselves. Exactly. But uh, but also this thing with, um, you know, soy milk, almond milk, all the different vegan alternatives is th- the reason why they're as expensive. And we got people like with James Cromwell. He's an like animal rights activist, actor guy who glued himself to the Starbucks uh, because right. this plant-based milk is more expensive than and uh the dairy milk and that's because of subsidies is that right oh absolutely i mean uh cow's milk first of all cow's milk production is going down 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 it's at something like 60 percent of what it was 20 years ago so there is less cow's milk being produced because nobody wants there's nobody around to buy it and in fact the federal government mandates that cow's milk be served in all public schools that receive any kind of federal funding now, this is remind you, remind you of the fact that the government knows that 80% of people of Asian uh, descent are lactose intolerant, that somewhere between 60 and 70% of people of Hispanic and African descent are lactose intolerant. So knowing that a large number of already disadvantaged people in many cases uh, are allergic to a product that you're forcing them to be fed in, in a school setting, and, and yet they continue on because the milk and dairy industry has so much money and pays their lobbyists so well. And the lobbyists then pass that on to the, to the legislators. And so that said, um, and I don't remember exactly the point I was trying to make here, but yeah. the, the point is you were talking about all oh, the, the, the alternative milks that are available. at yeah. Yeah, yeah. Yes, they are. They are still slightly more expensive. I don't believe they're as expensive as, as, as these people would have us believe. I think it's just a way for Starbucks to make an extra 75 cents every <laughs> time they sell a cup of coffee, even though the using almond milk instead of cow's milk cost them maybe 10 cents more, yeah. you know, or something like that. Yeah. So it's, I have to yeah. say that the, the, con- the same people that approved the contracts to have dairy milk in the schools, those are the same people that uh, agreed to have Pepsi machines on every corner of my high school, making sure that the kids got plenty of soda and uh, sugary drinks. And then when they, you know, misbehave, pump them full of Adderall and Ritalin. That's it's- right. Oh, and by the way, we had to install metal detectors this year because we don't want people bringing guns. And <laughs> yeah, I, they don't care. Believe me, they do not care about your children. They, uh, they wouldn't, it wouldn't be, the whole thing is just set up to, to, to fail for kids. I mean, that's why the teachers are the most, you know, poorly paid public servants in the, in the country. I mean, if they really wanted to give kids a, a good head start, they wouldn't stuff cow's milk down their throat and they'd pay the teachers appropriately and they wouldn't sell them Pepsi on the corner and everything else. So they'll probably start uh, replacing teachers with ex convicts and say, this is part of your community service. You have to be a elementary school teacher for a while. And that's, that'll be the education system. Um, but yeah, and that brings us to all kinds of issues like the privatization of everything. And right now there's a lot of people pushing for the privatization of school to make it even better. Um, yeah, that hadn't worked out that well. I don't know a lot about the subject because I never had kids, but I, uh, I, I don't think that's worked out all that well, to be honest with you. Yeah. And, uh, did you have experience growing up in the public school? And, and was yeah I, yeah I was raised in public schools and I was brainwashed like everybody else. I mean I, I wasn't vegan when I was born, so yeah no I I went through the whole thing just like everybody else and mm-hmm. um, managed to get out alive. So did you have, you had to put your hand on the heart and stare at the that cloth and recite the uh, every morning every cri- morning cryptic uh-huh. poetry. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, right. yeah, it's something to be considered. I mean. So beyond beyond this this conversation about animal rights and everything lies an even darker thing, which is the profit mode, which is the American, you know, 1950s atomic 
um, industrialized world. It goes all the way back to the 1850s, but it's we just took a wrong turn somewhere. And that's kind of the end result of all conversations I'm having at the moment. So. But, uh, well, I think, you know, human, I think humans have taken wrong turns a couple of times in the past. And most of the time, nature has uh, a corrective for that. And that uh, those, those civilizations didn't work out and they went away. And I think the same, we're going to see the same thing here as well. I think the civilization has taken a wrong turn. It's destroying the ecosystem. It's killing the wildlife. It's, uh, it's altering, you know, uh, altering the whole uh, ecosystem and the way things work. And there will be a correction and nature, you know, nature will figure it out and, and something will come along. I mean, we've already seen little samples of, of various uh, infectious agents and things that can, that can have a huge impact, but those are, those are just, uh, just the beginning. And I, I honestly, as we said in the preamble to this, uh, to this uh, discussion, I, I think that uh, the time is coming, and and I'm not and I'm not uh, going to be disappointed if it does happen <laughs> in my lifetime. But I I think the time is coming where uh, humans will face a reckoning, and there's not won't be anything we can do about it. And the vast majority of humans, if not all of them, uh, will cease to exist, and and life will get on the way it was supposed to be, and always has been for the last you know billion years or so. Yeah. Yeah, and I'm, I'm, I mean, humans, you know, humans did okay. Humans lived on the planet for a million years and everything was fine. Okay? I mean, we, we don't know much about it because they didn't leave a bunch of crap behind to, to tell us. But <laughs> for a million, for a million years, uh, human animals lived pretty much like every other animal on the planet and everything was perfectly okay. And then, you know, maybe 10 or 15,000 years ago, things just started going. And that's when that, uh, that faded left turn in Albuquerque that you mentioned earlier, uh, <laughs> took place but uh i i i'm a firm believer that the um the uh the system has a way to correct itself and and will do so in a relatively short amount of time did you ever get a chance to read the yuval noah harari book uh this brief what is it a brief uh history of mankind yeah yeah i read that years a couple years ago yeah yeah see this really opened my mind to the idea that we were you know, like you said, millions of years, nomadic, not leaving a trace, no styrofoam, no graffiti, no plastic. Um, and it's only in the, uh, the last 10,000 years we start uh, uh, not being nomadic, hanging out, growing some crops. But we forgot that we, we can't shit where we eat. You know, we can't shit in our backyard. And then we had diseases and plagues. And we went from having a lifespan of 80 years being nomadic cavemen people and then it went down to about 40 years as soon as that we began the agricultural revolution and and it's because of the disease and the pestilence that came from staying in one spot so that already told me that it was already more natural to live this paleo nomadic lifestyle and so i thought oh man we we need to make a regression back to uh, kind of a caveman style of living but uh you probably think it's too late what do you what do you think <laughs> yeah well i just don't know what you're going to do with uh you know 10 billion people there's just not enough caves <laughs> yeah. for 10 billion people not enough uh you know natural easily attainable you know plant-based food for 10 billion people uh, and not to mention 10 billion people on a planet that's now a lot warmer than it was uh during the you know perfect timing when when man was was thriving so uh there's going to be a lot of change there's going to be a lot less food produced and while we're speaking of food i mean uh animal agriculture is is the the least efficient way to produce food i mean you have to feed something like 14 pounds of grain in order to get one pound of meat and so uh if people think that you know having more pig farms and more uh chicken farms is going to get us out of the situation then then they're completely wrong minded. The vast majority of the rainforest is being cleared. And I think I read it something like the an area the size of Rhode Island every year is being is being cleared out of the rainforest. But virtually all of that is being cleared to either graze cattle or to produce food to graze cattle or to grow cattle. So we're destroying the rainforest, destroying the planet, and all of this just so that people can eat eat meat three times a day. And, and that's just, it's ridiculous. And it's going to come to an end one way or the other. I mean, we can either voluntarily stop doing it 
and utilize the resources more efficiently um, or we'll have it stop for us because we're all going to die from you know some zoonotic disease like we saw with the COVID virus and which we will, I guarantee you, see again, uh, certainly in our lifetime. Um, yeah, you know, and talking about inefficiency, 2,000 gallons of water to produce uh, one pound of meat. I mean, we just don't have that. I mean, the, the droughts and everything, it's just something's going to have to give. We, we've stressed the system to near its breaking point, And we're talking about probably over just the next few years, think major changes are going to have to happen. Mm. And, and it's to be said that the it wasn't built inefficiently because we're stupid. It was built inefficiently to funnel money from the bottom to the top and make sure that um, a select group of people get the the money from it. Um, everybody that I've interviewed about the agricultural system has told me the way we're doing it is inefficient. It's not working. It's hurting us. It's it's using more resources than it needs to. I mean, you were talking about soybeans we're growing in order to feed cattle to and then transport it. We're going to use diesel in the tractors to plow the fields as well to grow the soy and then to use diesel to transport it in tankers across the world to somebody else. It's so stupid. <laughs> uh, yeah, and, and it's unsustainable. It just can't go on forever. I mean, we, we've, we've had a nice run here for a few hundred years, but I mean, that's a fraction of a second in ecological time and and it's just uh it's not sustainable and it's all going to go away here pretty soon i think so as we wean ourselves off of this and we if we we're obviously going to give it a try where we're going to try this a lot of people probably stop eating meat because it's too expensive or 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 whatever what do you think is the thing that's going to replace it are we going to immediately start eating each other or or does the cannibalism come in later few few decades later <laughs> yeah, I'm not sure about the cannibalistic uh, attitude, but I, I there, there's no reason to eat any anybody's flesh of any sort. I mean, we're we're basically plant based animals. We're animals that were made to eat primarily plants, and we get all the nutrients we need. There, there's absolutely nothing, no reason to eat an, an, another animal if, if if there's no no indication for it at all. In fact, it's not only is it harmful to the environment and obviously harmful to the animal, but it's harmful to our bodies too. I mean, mm. half the people in this country die of heart disease. And yet vegans like me with a cholesterol of 160, which kind of comes naturally, we don't die of heart disease at all. Okay. So half the people in the country are dying basically because of what they eat. And then when you throw in things like colon cancer and prostate cancer, all of which are linked to, to uh, meat and dairy uh, di- heavy diets, uh, most people in this country die of causes that they don't have to die from. Um, he talked about the uh, uh, life expectancy earlier, um, you know, going from 80 years as, uh, in, as you know, free living people to 40 years during the, you know, in part of the Industrial Revolution. And then it was as high as 77 here, but now we're already starting to see it decrease. I think it's decreased from uh, 77 to 74, 75. And it's, who knows, maybe, maybe that was as high as it's ever going to get. And it may be that every year from now on, it's just going to go down, down, down because I mean, look at what we're doing. Look at the environment we put ourselves in. Look at the crap that we're breathing and swallowing and, and everything. And wouldn't surprise me at all. And, and plus all the, the new diseases that we're unleashing into the environment that, that have never been present before and that we have no natural immunity for. Um, all of that stuff's going to have an impact on life expectancy. So you think it's, we're going to thin the herd quite a bit. So let me ask you this. Where do you get your protein from? Right? And a lot of people out there that maybe are skeptical about the whole thing, they need to know that. Well, I get the same. I get the, my protein from the same place that an elephant gets its protein when it eats an all plant-based diet. There is protein in, in all plant products. Now, there is concentrated protein in things like grains and uh, uh, legumes like uh, peas and beans and things like that were, I mean, some of the world's biggest bodybuilders and, and strongest strongmen uh, are vegan and subsist off of uh, supplements. They need more protein than you and I do. So they eat things like pea protein that's refined from uh, the pea plant and, and other places. But the bottom line is no human being that, that has become vegan has ever suffered from protein deficiency. It just doesn't happen. If you eat a wide variety of plants, you get plenty of protein. I mean, the average person, the average carnist, the average uh, meat eater in the country gets about three or four times more protein than they need. 
which is not a good thing necessarily. It's, it, I mean, if you're a bodybuilder, yeah. But if you're like Joe Schmo sitting on his recliner every day and drinking a six pack of Coors or something, the, all that extra protein, all it does is uh, affect your kidneys and causes kidney issues and, and problems. So uh, the bottom line is nobody that becomes vegan will ever have any problem with protein. It just doesn't happen. Never has. I mean, there's millions of us vegans running around. I've been vegan for 29 years. I haven't uh, ha- suffered any uh, protein in- insufficiency problems or any other insufficiency problems. Uh, so that's it's just again, it's a it's an argument made up by people who want you to eat more meat, and so they can make more money off you eating more meat. Uh, and it just doesn't exist. And, and just like children don't have to drink cow's milk to have strong bones. I mean, that's ridiculous. Mm-hmm. Uh, in fact, they've done studies that show that vegan children do better with their bones than kids that drink cow's milk. And by the way, they have a lot less ear, ear, ear infections. Their immune systems are, are better. Uh, they generally do better overall with uh, childhood diseases. So uh, if, you're a, if you're a mom and you're still feeding your kid cow's milk, you should stop doing that right away. Yeah. And I want to bring up a really important fun fact for everybody out there that the, one of the Guinness Book of World Record uh, holders for the oldest living dog was a vegan dog who got fed lentils. And this dog lived to be, it was a border collie that lived to be about 25 years old. You have to look it up. Uh, that is testament enough for me to give it a sh- try. And everybody out there should really give it a try. I know you're scared. Just do it. Nothing scary about it. Like I said, uh, there are vegan restaurants all over the world now. Uh, and every restaurant that's not vegan, you can still go in and ask for vegan food. And I've, I've never gone into any restaurant and not been able to get something vegan uh, to eat. It, it's just not an excuse to say, oh, it's too hard. And it's, it's yeah. not too hard. And it's just a matter of a, it's a different set of habits. And you can buy vegan cookbooks. You can buy, you know, you can have a vegan chef come to your house and teach you how to cook vegan. It doesn't, you don't even have to do any of that though. I mean, it's, it's, it's very intuitive and it's just a matter of, of changing your mindset. And by the way, when you become vegan, six weeks, people say almost routinely after six weeks of not eating meat, you lose all taste for it. So it's not like you're going to spend the rest of your life craving a hamburger or craving a steak. Um, it doesn't sound good at all. After a few weeks, you don't, you don't even want that stuff in your body anymore after you've been away from it for a relatively very short while. Um, so, and, and now there's so many of the fake meats and stuff too. Anyway, if, if you do like the, the way it feels or taste or whatever, you've got lots of options, you know, fake chicken, fake, fake meat. So, um, uh, you don't even have to, it, it's just kind of a no brainer for me. I don't, I don't see why anybody, uh, wouldn't do it once they were faced with the facts. Yeah. They look at the animal cruelty, the, the immense animal cruelty involved. And that's the main reason I did it. Uh, but also if you look at the environmental impacts and the health impacts, there's just absolutely no reason to be eating meat, except that you're in the habit of eating meat because you've been eating meat all your life. But I ate meat until I was 30 years old, and then I just quit one day. Yeah, And it's, been, it's not hard at all. See, you said it again, and I want to reiterate this, that this is a multi-pronged reason to to do to be nice to animals and to go vegan. It's A, good for the environment, B, good for you, and C, you know, Good for the animals. I don't know. It's win-win-win for everybody. The environment, you, and the animals. Everybody's okay, but we. What's the holdup? And I do well, get the holdup is all the money. It's all the money that the meat and dairy people are making. I mean, they're making billions and billions of dollars every year, and so there's there's resistance to changing anything that provides them with so much money. And because they have so much money. You know, not only do they have advertising, but they have the government on their side because they've got lobbyists and everybody paying, you know, paying people to, to vote the way they want them to vote. And that's that's why it's as it, hard to change it as it is. But I mean, that's why it's as hard to change anything. It's why it's so hard to change apartheid or or uh, slavery, human slavery or anything else. I mean, there's always somebody out there making a lot of money that's got the government on, in their back pocket. And, you know, the people. The people uh, are the losers. Uh, in this case, the animals are the losers, but we're the losers too. Yeah. Yeah. Cause we're going to, in the end, we're going to lose everything at the hands of these systems uh, for degradating our, our 
environment, then degrading our independence and our autonomy. You know, I was talking to somebody, they, they've taken away every possible chance for you to be a baker or a shoemaker or a blacksmith or any of the things that you used to be able to open up shop doing. It's been corporatized to the point where uh, we're pretty much locked out to a point where we don't have any influence anymore in the, in the legislative process or anything like that. And I'm sure you probably see it in stuff like sh the sugar industry as well, not just meat, but, um, you know, industries like that. Have you s seen the, a corruption and where money overtakes? Absolutely. It's part of it's part and partial with capitalism. I mean, that's just what capitalism says is, you know, he that, you know, sells you all the products is the guy that gets rich and. And uh, by the way, the government's going to help them out with it because you put the right people in government to uh, to help you out. And so it's a cabal, really, of the government and, and big corporations and people with lots of money to take as much advantage of the people and the world and animals and everything else as they can to, to make money. And to be fair, the, they also hire think tanks, these little groups or whatever they they try to figure out the psychology of how to sell an idea to the people where you get Midwestern hardworking Americans to vote against their own best voting interests. They'll, they'll vote against what's good for them. And so psychology can't be discounted in one of the weapons that they're using to fool everybody into continuing this. And people really need to wake up to this idea that you're being gamed, you're being fooled. And um, and this reactionary type of uh, politics is going to also not get us anywhere. And we're seeing that right now. A lot of reactionary, emotionally driven um, media and things like this. And it keeps people in this mass hypnosis or mass psychosis where they feel like law and order and hierarchy is the only way to go. And I'll, I don't think I'll ever understand that. I don't know about you, but as we were saying before, George Carlin is pretty much the only person that said it before. When I think when I was 10 years old, I listened to George Carlin rant and rave about the world. And, and he's, he's just, a genius and a philosopher and everybody out there was going through hard times. I would listen to uncle George and he'll set you straight. Right. Amen. I love George Carlin. <laughs> well, we'll wrap it up here. I love talking to you. We'll have you back. We'll keep on. So there's any news. It's really important that people get involved, go to your website, stay up with the news. Um, is there anything you want to tell anybody out there? Uh, more information from our organization at animalliberationpressoffice.org or Animal Lib Press Office on Instagram. Uh, we, uh, we talk, we release uh, communiques uh, almost daily about people that have uh, broken the law to help animals and how they've gotten away with it and how you too could get active and do the sort, same sort of thing. I mean, uh, you know, we all uh, have a role to play. And if you, uh, if you want to just look and see what's the uh, most effective thing you can do to um, help animals or whatever it is you're you're into, uh, you, it's it's probably not going to work for some uh, government agency or uh, or uh, or going down to the uh, poll and voting. It's uh, it's to get active on a daily basis and to take action into your own hands, find something that's not going right, and uh, and do whatever it takes to fix it, as you so eloquently said earlier. By any means necessary. Yeah, by any means necessary, aka go out and fuck shit up make it happen i don't think that's you can't you, that's not illegal activity fucking shit up that's that's totally okay to tell people to do go fuck shit up <laughs> all right thanks well, Jer thanks jerry yeah it's good seeing you today thanks for having me